Welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. I'm here with Lindsay Alton Bogart. <laughs> Did Correct. I get that right? Yes. You have a, a Dutch surname, which is interesting for a, an English one to try to pronounce. Uh, uh, Lindsay, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so you are the founder of Mirror Mirror, uh, at which uh, I had the delight of uh, being introduced to in depth yesterday. And I know you had to, did a whole day of training, hence the the voice is. Um, yes, my voice has gone a bit, but I think we'll be okay. But we'll be okay, and uh, yeah. So and let's talk about so and Mirror Mirror is a tool that I'm wishing we can talk more about in terms of uh, bringing alignment to teams, which of course is really important for people in organisations right now. And so I think it's going to be a lot of it, uh, there'll be a lot of interest in this, to- this topic from people. Should, but should we, should we start at the start in terms of the genesis for this tool and, and how you got interested in, in alignment? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so I'm actually English um, and I've married a Dutchman, so he- hence the um, unpronounceable surname, especially with the sore voice. Gosh, <clears throat> I think we'll be okay here. Um, so, uh, yeah, I came over to the Netherlands to work for a large uh, organization. And before that, I'd only actually been working in small organizations, um, teams of sort of 10 people. Um, and when you're working in a team of 10, you can really get to grips with you know, what's happening, who's doing what, uh, what happened, what are we doing next, uh, what's our purpose even. And when I, when I came across to the Netherlands after what I thought, thought was loads of experience, ready to, ready to go into the big league with organizations, I found that um, I didn't have the clarity and I couldn't get a really clear sense of what was going on. I was in a team of 20 people. Uh, it was the knowledge sharing team, fascinating stuff. Um, but people were in different places. Uh, people were looking at different versions of documents at different times. Some were in meetings, some were not in meetings. Some were very, very senior, some were very junior. And the clarity that I thought was essential for a, for a team that I'd enjoyed in the small business environment was, was just not there. And my role was in communications and uh, I felt that I really should have that clarity in this role. I felt that responsibility. Um, and I, I, I called it the fog at the time. The fog is, you know, assumptions, misunderstandings, um, different interpretations mainly. It's about diversity. <clears throat> and initially I thought it was me. And I thought there's something here that I need to learn because everybody else looks completely happy. Um, but uh, I realized as, I, as the years went on and as I joined other large organizations, it's not just me. It's just something that has become the wallpaper. And misalignment can get, when the level of frog gets so high and misalignment gets so bad, the implications can be attributed to other things. You know, oh, it's, um, you know, projects fail because um, of this and that, and uh, projects fail because of leadership, and projects fail because of and trying to blame something, but it's actually what's happening between people that is the problem. If there is misalignment, the problems um, can be huge. So that's where it all started. Right. It's a. It's a. So it sounds like a sense of I'm. I'm not. I'm not sure what's going on here, but everybody else seems to. And then over time, discovering well, hang on, no, <laughs> nobody else does either. Right. Something like that. <laughs> And also, there's actually a bias called false consensus, which is really interesting because leadership teams can have this understanding, well, because they know what's going on and because they've communicated mm. with their people about what's going on, they, they get this idea that it just will cascade. And it doesn't, of course, because of a number of things um, that we'll get into, I think. One of those is about social constructionism. Um, but the problems caused by Ms. Lyman are probably worth going into in themselves at the moment, actually. Okay, uh, uh, okay. So the the problems that it that that, that gets the the problems that emanate from this situation where people are not aligned, they're not clear on. And so yeah, well, it's worth actually. So so we can get into that. And when we say alignment, how do you define alignment? That might be interesting. Well, you know, I think traditionally people have looked at alignment um, as you know, if you, if the individual goals match up to the team goals and they match up to the organisation strategy then we're all aligned. Now, of course, that's one thing, and it's, it's very important, of course. But alignment is between people. And where I got that from was this fascinating colleague of mine who's actually a professor in uh, philosophy at um, London University at the moment, Johan Siebers, who just really pointed out that dialogue, for example, 
is about the meaning that is shared between people. No one person can have a dialogue with themselves. And I think business is traditionally focused on the individual. It's focused on what's their personality? What do they understand? What are their responses to these questions about them? I mean, the 360 feedback, for example, that tool, it's all about what does somebody think about that person? And that's the focus of the tool, it's fine. But this whole idea that it's a collection of individuals all vertically looking up to a strategic alignment is only half the picture. The other half is about what's between people. Okay. Yeah, because I must admit, when I, when I think of the term, that's what I think about. It's, it's sort of my nose pointing in the same way as, 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 as the rest of the people in my, in my team or in my organization. But, but then how the hell do you know what's between people? Like I can visualize how you can understand, you could ask someone what's your goal or what's your focus. But how, how do we inquire into what's going on between people? I mean, well, that's, that's what Mirror Mirror is all about. So Mirror Mirror is a tool that helps people align to the strategy as well as between each other. And very simply, what we do is we collect um, information by way of survey or interview about not what people think about themselves or what they think about other people, but what they think is happening between the team they're in, because that's the context they're in. So if you can ask people, is it safe for people, not you, but people to share, for example, um, or to raise issues? Is it safe for people to raise issues in the team? Well, if everybody asks that question, answers that question and then you compare the results, you get fascinating data, um, not just on the average score, but about the range of responses within that were given about what people perceive as happening. And perception is reality, actually, isn't it? So by taking information like that in lots of different category areas, both about what people think and what people, how people behave, between people in teams, you can actually measure and identify and measure misalignment. Right. Okay. Yeah. So you can identify and measure not just in terms of how individuals line up, but also by asking people what their perceptions are, you get some sense of their view of what's happening between team members and that you use as your way of measuring the this alignment between people. Yes, because if you add into this the communication piece, which is if you're talking to people about how they see the world in a, in a way that is relating them to their context, you can move the needle and you can, you can help people see a better uh, mental model that they can spring to that doesn't take a lot of time and it doesn't take a lot of money. Um, through a dialogue about their context and the way that they see things and the way that they could see things um, as in a facilitation way uh, that uh, allows them to get a better result for themselves. Okay, so this is this, this idea of a, of, a sh- of a mental model that they hold. And, and is, it, is this about inquiring into what that mental model, model is and then offering people different mental models to to jump onto or to 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 adopt well it's quite interesting because when you look at um facilitation and i think this is not a consulting piece there's Mm. people do not align by being told to align to some um themselves you know you cannot tell people to align they have to do that work for themselves by starting with where they are at and they're relating that to to something else in order to be able to move their mental model and so the facilitation piece is as, as unbiased as possible based on the fact that we, we have a certain anchor points of research that we're using. So we have, we have our bias of the research that we believe makes effective teams um, that do align well. And that's the basis of the questions. And then, but from that is the data. And the data that comes out of it will enable people to, to look at that and start to discuss it between themselves, which is a facilitation piece um, from the outside in order to be able to realize what else could be better for themselves. So we don't give people new mental models. We just open the door so that they can give themselves new mental models. Okay. And it's the, it's the, it's the magic of the facilitated conversation that has people adopt new mental models that ultimately allow the team to, to, to align. So there's, yes. a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an alchemy in the in the facilitation somehow. Yeah, exactly. So there's two parts of the process. One is the identification of alignment gaps in data in a report. 
but the, but the second part is using that data to take the team to a different place because i think even them seeing that is is possibly something they weren't conscious of that the results aren't sort of already known necessarily um and it's the first time that they've been able to look take a look at well of say that let's say there are eight people in the team of the eight people in the team they wouldn't have really been able to have that visual on where everyone's coming from because it's just too long-winded to discuss um, so it's a very short sharp focused way to get clarity on what is in the room on a, on a holistic sort of systemic level about the team and its effectiveness and therefore what would they like to change and how can they do that And why do you think, why, because I do think that this is a personal conversation right now for companies. Why do you think this is becoming more important for businesses right now? Well, I mean, if you look at the way that work's going, um, you know, there are, I think if we go backwards, say 50 years, there used to be people working in offices together um, and they would have, they would be located in the same place and work would go in a, in a far less frenetic way than it does now because of all the technologies we've got. And there was more opportunities to ask questions and reflect and get to grips on what was happening, arguably. More diverse teams and dispersed teams these days and short-term staff and contracting staff and automation of technology and everything that's going on is speeding things up whilst there's still more demand for sort of tailored and niche products and more of a need for accelerated learning and performance. And if you put all that together, there's more and more scope coming up, if you like, for misalignment. Um, so this fog that, we, that I want to come back to, which is about um, assumptions that people will make, uh, biases that will creep in, um, misunderstandings based on perhaps not knowing each other's personalities or the way of working or, or thought processes um, between team members um, will occur more and more. And, and, and fog is, because it's invisible, you know, we, we can just carry on just having a frustrating, inefficient time if we want to. Um, but if you take a concerted and focused look at alignment, um, which again, doesn't take longer than half a day a day, then the value of that is so high because you're, you're unpicking mistakes before they happen, if you like. So uh, I think the, the future of work means that there's more need to align. Yeah. And, and probably more of a need to, con to continually realign, right? Because if it's true that there's a lot of this mo 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 accelerating pace of change around teams and within teams, then this becomes a, almost an ongoing practice or, or routine for teams, would you say? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's, there's a kind of clearing the fog process that you would use to start with with a team. Um, and a lot of, but, there, but there's a de alignment maintenance. And... Mm. A lot of agile teams have a lot of tools or little processes for agile for, for alignment maintenance, like stand-ups, reflections, um, and things like that. Um, so, so it, it's it's not as if there's one way to do it. Uh, but I think teams can't they have a job to do, and you can't. It's quite difficult to sort of focus on alignment and work all the time. Uh, so, I think an alignment process is something that a team might either want to go through every on a routine basis, depending on how complicated their situation is and how much fog they've got. Right. Uh, yeah. And that, <laughs> although that's interesting, isn't it? Cause what, cause sometimes the only way to know how much fog you've got is to, is to enter into the process, right? And that reveals it. Yeah. But I think there's symptoms. I mean, for example, if the team leader is saying that people are saying different things, or, or people are making different, taking different actions based on what other people thought decisions was. I mean, coming back to this, what is the problem? Um, you know, it's, it's characterized, if you like, by um, people noticing that there's a waste of time and money going on, uh, that things could have been done differently, uh, that not everybody is all connected in the way that they could be. Uh, people are demotivated, perhaps. Uh, there's, co there's conflict, actually, that's a, a characterization of, align of misalignment um you know and bad results i mean uh, oftentimes leaders of, of of you know either in people performance or leaders themselves they find that they can't put their finger on what's going wrong and the reason for that is because you can't say that any one thing was the cause behind project failure but you can say that if people feel misalignment and project fails 
then probably being in better aligned would have helped. Yes. And there was something I, I picked up on in, in doing some of the reading uh, around your tool, and that's that uh, we, we often go to, oh, well, it must be that person or it must be that boss uh, when, when we start to pick up on some of these symptoms. And, and I think what you're saying here is, well, it, it might be, but it's also worth looking at the, the, the alignment of the team overall as opposed to going to personality. Yeah, exactly. Because the team, what's happening between people, how people are at reacting and reacting to those reactions, that, that's all about how we are as individuals. So you, you can, it is quite easy to say it's the, it, you know, it's, it's the leader is at, at fault. Uh, but, you know, who's, who's perfect? Um, it, you know, maybe the leader is struggling with their own sense of reality and their own sense of alignment around who they are discussing stuff with. Um, so I, I, I agree with you. I don't think it's, it's helpful to blame. I think it's helpful for everybody to take ownership and help each other. Yeah. It just, it just reminds me of a story I read uh, by a guy called David Marquette. I don't know if you've come across it to turn the ship around. I don't know. I haven't no, heard. So this is, a, it's become a fair, somewhat famous story now of, of a, of a captain in the U S Navy who has a, a submarine. It's the worst performing submarine in the fleet. And he takes it from the worst performing, I think, to the top, to top performing, I think, in a year w- without firing a single person, <laughs> right? So that it turns out there was nothing wrong with a single individual on the whole ship. It, and, that, and, and he doesn't consciously go through a process of alignment, but he does engaging a lot of these reflective activities and, and spends a lot of focus and time on uh, understanding team dynamics and people getting clear on 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 where they're going and and you could see it as an uh, as an alignment exercise I I, I believe I think I, I think I heard about that actually and I think I heard that it was all about empowerment didn't he get people to make yeah, the right decisions yeah. a lot of it was about empowerment moving towards this inte- well it's a couple of things interestingly I think pertain to what you're talking about one was uh, tran- a big part of it was transparency so everybody was really clear on what the overall mission was. And so there was a big focus on transparency. And then the second thing is exactly as you say, this intent-based leadership where people would stand up and say, I intend to do this. So uh, creating a leader, leader culture was, was, was a way to summarize it. Right, and I think one of the other things that's going on is that people, I continually hear, even in internal comms conferences, people saying, you know, we have to get them engaged. We have to get them to buy into these values. We have to get them to understand these messages. And automatically, you don't have then a reciprocal dialogue relationship with these people because your agenda counts, their agenda doesn't count, and it all undermines this whole empowerment thing. Um, and so alignment, I think, is, uh, you know, let's, supposing you're a team leader and, you, and you get a, uh, you're a new team leader and you get a report and it tells you what the team is thinking and feeling what the difference is, where they, where they converge and diverge before you've even met them. And then, then you know where to have the conversations because otherwise you're, you're talking about things that people maybe already have their own understanding of the meaning of words so that they're, they're kind of connecting but half not connecting with you at the same time, but that's not what that was on their mind as a concern or that's not the question that they had. So I think, I think these days in complicated situations or complex situations, it's extremely difficult in conversations for people to have empowering two-way dialogues that don't just take forever and people haven't got forever um and so you know we've got all of these tools and there's some fantastic tools out there that are more automated um and they're, they're they're only about data they're not about qualitative responses but and that they do pulse checks and i think that's the ongoing alignment thing that you're talking about where uh, we just need you know, we can use tools to to keep to to steer the conversation efficiently, um, in order to be to support this uh, ourselves in this this kind of unnatural working world. Right. So that's interesting. So what I, I suppose what I'm taking from that is, you, you're right. The dialogue does tend to take longer. Right. Do, do, just a tell versus a dialogue. Well, a tell's quicker. Mm. Uh, and I guess in certain circumstances that works and it is efficient because you, you, you tell and people absorb that message and they do what you've told them and the thing that you've told them is the right thing to do. So that would make sense. But yeah, 
I suppose incre- I, there's a couple of things that come increasingly. There is no one individual who is sufficiently cognizant of all the factors such that whatever it is that they do tell people to do is the right thing. So that's sort of one thing that's shifting. Uh, and then the second thing is because, yeah, because there's so much diff- <laughs> pulls on the attention of people and there's so many ways for people to invest their time in a day, you telling them maybe one thing, but if they've got pulls from competing sources, then how do you know your tell is going to win, right? So this idea of us coming together and aligning as a group makes a lot, a lot more sense. Yeah, and also there's a lot of social pressure and political pressure. I mean, psychological safety is a huge issue because it's a huge issue. I mean, the, the idea that people feel safe enough to tell their boss exactly what they think <laughs> in, in, in a nice way, I guess, um, is, is far from the truth uh, in many organizations, just because it's just difficult to do that with the contract you mm. have with the organization or, or how well you know them or, you know, have you even met them? Um, so if you've got all of these pressures and the time constraints and everything else, an effective conversation is going to be difficult. And I know then there's plenty of materials out there to help people do that. So, I mean, alignment, I think, is a term we're using for a lot of things that are already happening in the market with um, pulse checks and tools and, um, you know, stand-ups and agile and everything. But um, we're, focusing on, on, we're focusing on alignment and a way to achieve that in a kind of swift, deep dive, thorough and comprehensive um, a, consistent approach that enables this vertical alignment to the strategy this horizontal alignment between people to kind of nail it because as far as i understand over the past 15 years whilst miss whilst alignment is becoming now something that people focus on as a topic in itself it was previously a bit like dark matter because it's invisible it's, it was just part of the wallpaper as we said at the beginning of the call you know it's it's very powerful, but it's just kind of life. I mean, some of the reactions I've got to this idea in the past have been, well, you know, this is this is just this is just life. I mean, this this you know, we've got better, bigger priorities. And then at the same time, people say, well, you know, our objective is to get um, a quarter percent uh, increase in EBITDA by the end of the year, and we're going to do we're going to spend you know X amount of thousands and millions getting that. You just kind of think, well. If there was a focus on alignment, which is not that expensive, to be honest, across the entire organization, you probably could get a lot more than that because all of these underlying fundamental thoughts about what are we doing and how are we doing it, if that's confused, that's a massive time waste. It's hugely unproductive. I mean, just in terms of how people feel, staff retention and and, and, um, uh, attraction and retention um and and all these huge issues that hr and communications and other people od learning and development all of these professions are trying to get on top of if that's not right um then of course it's going to slow everything down and undermine performance and profits um and uh, anything else so I, i'm looking at alignment and i just think we really really have to take a proactive stance on managing it it's a management issue it's a risk right so it's not just the small stuff that people say oh yeah well that's life you know we've we've you know we've got other we've got other priorities this is a priority but it's just, yeah. it's just looking at it in a different way that's right and i suppose it's 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 uh people don't have a problem investing in time in building strategies and doing analysis and and, and creating a comms plan i mean these are all for, for, well kind of accepted and understood parts of the process of managing a business and and so it, yeah so it seems to be now we're just we're, we're, the suggestion here is and there's a very valuable investment to be made in building alignment across the organization uh, and engaging the collective intelligence of of those that you're working with to achieve an alignment as a dialogue <laughs> Right, as a as a as a di- as a dialogue based process. Yeah, and um, you know, not thinking that either um, platforms like SharePoint or Yammer will solve it all because they have a slightly different purpose. You know, they're they're all about information sharing, transacting information, contact making. You're not going to get a huge amount of 
you know, significant alignment from those tools. And similarly, you're not going to get it from um, mass media. And I think, you know, coming out of the 80s, PR, you know, it was possible to have an intranet, it was possible to um, set up mass media channels that would just disseminate the message, uh, which is fantastic. And they do a lot of great work. But again, if you're talking about aligning people to the strategy and between each other and making sense of things for themselves in a way that relates to what they say and do with others every day, um, mass media communication only goes so far. And I mean, the internal comms profession, I don't know how close you are to it or um, how close any listeners are to it. They're going insane trying to do their best and are doing a fantastic job within the confines of the role that they have to communicate to people. And there are other you know, activities and some fantastic activities that do not just communicate to people, but between people, um, but it's quite limited. And I think the time's come to take a totally different approach um, because I think in some ways, mass media communication is undermining the business and disengaging employees. Right. Yeah. Cause we can always say, cause there's always a, uh, well, we put it out on Yammer or, you know, we've, we've, we've got it on the posters on the, on the lifts, you know, we, we've communicated it. Right. And of course that's, the, that's just the beginning really of a, of a process around alignment. Yeah, and I think the reasons why it actually disengages employees. I mean, sometimes I, I went to an agile conference and I said, oh, I have a background in internal comms. And, and they were like, ooh, tss, you know, get away from us. I go, oh, my God, <laughs> I didn't realize that's, that's um, the reaction to, to this kind of uh, background profession that I've got. Um, but I think because mass media communication, um, it reduces the ability of employees to influence their world because because the tone and the message is already fixed mm. um, and it, it removes the responsibility for managers to participate in the communications pro process because it's already been sent it's already been said um, and it 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 sort of um, it actually undermines clarity and honesty because it, it sort of exposes the areas of dissonance between the reality that people feel in their jobs and what they're told they should be feeling you know, our values are, you know, our mission is, you know, here's a success story. If that's not what people are feeling in their roles, it's just kind of like, I don't get that. You know, I don't buy that. And it's, it, it's, it's, it's definitely part of the solution, but on its own in this day and age, it's not getting, it's not getting right there. And what strikes me, and is, is this right, that it takes a certain type of leader to lead this type of process? Well, we would actually advise that um, an external facilitator or uh, an in-house um, facilitator is used for this uh, because, you know, the, the line manager has a hard time. They have their own reality at work. They are trying to make sense of things in their own way. They have their own biases. They have their own, as everybody does, they have their own interpretations of things. And whilst they have a role to share clarity on the frame in which people operate, um, it's their job to say, right, this is what we're doing. This is why we're all in the room, or at least the virtual room, perhaps. Um, for them to then to flip over and turn into um, facilitators of alignment within the team that they're actually running is a bit of an ask. Now, they could do, of course. They could do. But especially if psychological safety isn't, isn't rating high, isn't scoring high on um, the reports that we pr produce, at least, it's going to be difficult for people to open up and have an alignment conversation. So it's kind of ironic. Um, so we think that um, managers to participate in an alignment uh, process, which is a workshop basically, um, until they feel that they can take that capability for themselves, which they could well do. Right. Um, but that's, it's, not, it's not an easy ask. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And actually where I was, I was coming from, the question was about the hum potential humility required. Of the leader whether they run it or they use a facilitator because presumably sometimes the results of this can be a little uncomfortable well yeah i mean it takes i think if a team leader doesn't want to know what their people are thinking and feeling either because they don't care or because they actually are scared of the results they won't do it they'll find any excuse not to do it and there's um i don't know how many what proportion of leaders out there are in that bucket but it's it's a much much bigger than i think anyone would like to um, uh, predict. But um, I think if you put 
um, data from teams in a place that doesn't show who said what, it's an irrelevant who said what. And if you put it in a, a very sort of constructive place to raise to the issue. So for example, if there's a score on a report that says um, that, um, you know, do we take actions on agreed decisions well? Do we, do we take effective action based on our decisions? Supposing that score's really low. Now, that doesn't point to the leader necessarily, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a safe enough place to put the score down and have a conversation about it without it pointing to everyone and becoming a, a really um, confronting number. Uh, because it's like, right, would we like that score to be higher? What would we need to do? What would it look like if it was higher? Shall we invest our time in looking at and discussing that score? And if not, okay, no, let's move on to other stuff because we can only do so much. Um, now, if there's something about the line manager, we do have questions about line managers that are optional because they can be even more confronting, you're effectively rating the line manager, which I'm a huge fan of, by the way. Um, if they decide to put that in and, and everybody says that the line manager doesn't provide enough clarity, then yeah, <laughs> that's, that's quite confronting. But on the other hand, at least you're then dealing with it. How long do you want to carry on for not knowing what people think about the clarity that you provide on the, on the company strategy? Yeah. Um, so I'd, I'd say it really takes a wider organizational culture to be able to say, we will just accept what is. We will just say, look, let's be constructive. Where are we now? That's, and, and, and where do we want to be? And let's not hold anyone to blame. Let's just move on. Because if you don't, you're holding on to baggage and you are continuing the ineffectiveness that's undermining everything. So um, it is confronting. I think it can be presented in a very unconfronting way. So if those leader results don't want, to, if the leader doesn't want to share the results about themselves with the rest of the team, we, we put that into a separate report. That's perfectly reasonable. Um, but on the other hand, some leaders we've worked with are like, no, chuck it all in. Let's just deal with it. You know, and it's that attitude that I think is a maturity thing that is worth addressing. But I think you've made a really important there because the way I constructed that question was around the individual leader and do they have the chops to take the, you know, the bad news if that's what's coming. But you've, you've made an important point there that it, it, let's put the individual to one side. Does the culture support, you know, conversations around what is in a way that isn't judgmental of individuals? Because <laughs> if you've got that, you know, it's, it's, it's less dependent on the personality of the individual. And you're talking more about the environment where, yeah, people can have authentic conversations around what is. And, and to be honest, we include that in, the, in our question set as well. So our question set is designed to cover every single aspect of a team context um, that will influence how effective they are. And so we've got 12 questions in our quick scan report that has people rate the, the, how well the organization supports them in being effective, even if it's outside their sphere of influence. So things like recognition, reward, um, uh, uh, competencies. I mean, the competencies of the team, yes, of course, it's their responsibility to improve their own competencies, but they were picked to be there to start with by somebody um, who um, has assessed what the team needs. So they can't kind of just go about saying, well, competencies is no responsibility for the wider organization. I mean, uh, that, that's an easy one. Um, but also the culture. Is the culture of the organization inclusive? Because if it's not, that will affect the extent to which the team behaves in, a, in, in terms of um, inclusivity. And it will affect the extent to which they can align even. Um, and so the, the behaviors that we look at um, that are inside the team are, are in four basic categories that support the learning behaviors that support alignment. That's what we're rating. Um, but that goes outside the team as well in a, in, a, in a cultural thing. And you can't divorce the team effectiveness from that. Also, I totally agree. Yeah. And, and that's so that's interesting here. So it's, it, uh, to take the broader point, alignment isn't just about, uh, I suppose, a, alignment around goals or purpose or whatever it is you choose to orient yourself around as a team. It's are the supporting behaviors, is the supporting cultural context there that will enable alignment to happen effectively, right? So you're, you're asking the, the, the question of the environment and the content of whether or not alignment exists. Yeah, indeed. So we, we put into three sections. It's 
the extent to which the team has a shared understanding. So that's about content. So that would normally traditionally have been um, about messages, company messages, as well as understanding at a deep level, at the team level, who's doing what, when, how, why, all of that content stuff. The second piece is about learning behaviours um, in the team, between the team members, about um, how much uh, psychological safety they've got. Um, what about task cohesion? That's about commitment. The third area is about group potency. That's confidence the team has in being able to achieve their goals. And the last one is about interdependence. How, how, how much can they rely on each other? How much have they got to, to win or lose as a result? And then the last sort of area of questions that we have is about, and it's a smaller area, but it's, it is about the extent to which the organisation supports that team in being effective. Um, because if, for example, I've had this before, you know, you have a champion, a team champion, and after a couple of months, it's like, who's that? <laughs> you know, where, where, how do we know them? You know, what, what, when did they ever do anything? Um, now that's being really cynical and there's a lot of fantastic uh, champions out there. But it's very uh, easy for someone to have a champion role uh, and be totally distant from the team. So how can they possibly expect that team to, 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 to become known to other internal stakeholders or external stakeholders and, and start to leverage their position against other teams, etc.? So, um, yeah, I, I think alignment uh, it has, has th three areas and it's definitely cognitive and behavioural uh, and it's inside and outside. And um, when you start asking the key questions, uh, for example, on the content piece, what is happening in your organisation that will affect your team? And second part, what do you think should be done about it? Now, if you put everybody's answers together, we have to codify the qualitative answers. Um, uh, to, to, to be able to put them into visualizations and compare the, the meaning. But if you put everybody's answers together and everybody's saying completely different things with completely different responses, that's a fantastic in to the right conversation. Because if it's about something significant and they didn't have to, they, they wouldn't have known that before. Um, it, it, you've got to be able to, 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 to identify the gaps. I mean, half of it's about identification, what's going on. Um, so, so on these different levels, if you identify all of that, Pick the ones that you think are important. It's a fantastic way to get going into a really effective conversation um, that will support team effectiveness. Yeah, and I can also see how for those who are anxious about entering a dialogue, as you say, taking forever, it can, I can see how it's potentially assuages some of that anxiety because you say, okay, so we've got some starting points here. We've got some data. We know that the hot topics before we get into this and we can have a somewhat directed dialogue ar around these areas as opposed, it, as opposed to it being a, a complete free-for-all, as some people might see it, if, if, if you just entered a completely open dialogue. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and I also see how, because my experience as well is sometimes of retrospectives and where you do have these very de democratic processes, it, it, it can it can get a little bit wild in terms of what topics get talked about and sometimes it's the most dominant voice in the room and sometimes people will vote for a topic which you know everyone sort of knows that that's been what's voted for but it's a bit sort of well really is that where we're going to talk so so uh, so this feels like it gives a little potentially a bit more structure to those types of conversations yeah and i think uh, you know like we said the data is just the starting point mm. it's the door opener and it's, a, it's an extremely informed door opener, put it that way. Um, but the, the alignment process itself, um, you don't want people to get caught up in the weeds of, well, you said and I said and well, I thought and yeah, but you did this. And, you know, you've, that's uh, the, the good practice dialogue here has got some ground rules. You know, and it's really, uh, and that's, that's an important part of starting to use the data. It's like, let's have a conversation where the status is left at the door where people are respected to having their own views and everybody's views are real for them at that time. And um, let's have a, a place where people can, 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 can say what they want, but, but try not to talk for too long. And people don't interrupt them. Um, and, and everyone gets the opportunity to really ask why and be asked why and be heard. Because half of alignment is actually getting behind decisions that people don't, wouldn't normally agree with. Um, but once they've been heard and once they've heard somebody else's reasoning behind them, they're much more ready to do that um, because it's about the team goal. It's not about who's winning. 
So having people in a place where they're briefed that the alignment process involves acceptance, actually, um, to align on disagreement and to align on what action will be taken. That's alignment too. Yeah, because I can imagine some people listening to this and they're like, oh, you know, this all sounds very, very good and humane and, uh, and, and touchy-feely and, and the right thing to do. But what happens if I enter this process and, you know, I end up with a team that's aligned in a completely different direction to, to where I want them to go? You know, if I'm, if I'm, let's say, a CEO of a business, right, does, does, does that fear emerge? No, well, that needs correction. Because like we said, a team has a frame in which they can play. And they're not, they don't get to decide that frame unless, of course, they're totally self-managed. And it's a, <clears throat> it's a, a, different, a different way of working. Um, maybe they get to make suggestions. Maybe they get to try out innovations. That's fine. But that, that, the nature of the frame and what the frame is, that's absolutely crucial. And we find there are two key areas of misalignment. One is an information gap, which is super easy to fix because as soon as you know what the gap is, then you know either when to fix it or how to fix it, what to say to fix it. And then the fix could be, we don't know the answer, we have to find out, or we're never going to go the, know the answer, we have to accept it, or this is the answer. The second kind of alignment gap is about conflicting perspective. And that's where all of the stuff comes in about the fog, the, the assumptions, uh, the beliefs, the values, the different principles or standpoints that people take into their life and their personality, their biases. And, and there's only a couple of things that you can do with that. Um, now, when managing alignment, you have to draw the line on how long will this conversation take because everybody's time is being taken up here. So if, you're going to, if it's a thorny topic, it's going to take a long time. I would suggest that, that idea, that conversation, is um, if it can't be dealt with at the time, it's noted and it's agreed that there will be a, a dialogue on that at a separate moment because you don't want to get, like I said, bogged down into one area that's just too difficult for that moment. So everything's in this process of alignment, you have to keep moving because there's usually a fair amount to deal with and you don't have a lot of time. But if, if it's not too thorny and it's not too big, then there's, there's really only three things that occur. Like I said, first, it's you, people have to accept a decision maybe that they don't agree with. Um, but when you've got different perspectives, clarity and hearing other people's points of view can often get people to, like I said, change mental models invisibly and maybe not even known to themselves. But if somebody says, well, actually, the decision I took was based on this because I realized that if we did that, the receiving party would feel this and they would, they would take have this reaction to it so I thought this was a better idea then clarity can very easily move towards actual agreement where there was a gap um, so people will say oh, oh well yeah that's quite a good idea maybe we could try that um, or I can understand why that decision has been made now now I can find it easier yeah. to accept yeah so that's clarity on the thought process behind somebody else's point of view that actually now makes sense or another way forward, the last way forward, is to build a bridge. So it's having two perspectives and say, well, if we did it like this, it's, we get this. Or somebody else saying, well, if we did B, we'll get this. And then that's innovation when they start to say, well, actually, if we did a mixture of A and B, that would be even better. And I'm not saying that alignment is easy, but that is what happens when you get people in a room, when they are inclusive and respectful, and they have the team goals at the forefront. Uh, that's where the mirror magic happens because just within minutes, a problem that could have gone on forever with all of this uh, angst and frustration turns into actually a constructive new way forward. Yeah, and that's certainly been my, yeah, often my, it's what I talked about, uh, that the alchemy sometimes of these processes, this a kind of a magic occurs just, just by having these sort of heart to heart, yeah, yeah dialogue, but respectful conversations. But there's one area of all of this that um, is the dark side. I don't know, we should go, we need to talk about the dark side of Miss Yeah, Alignment. absolutely. Let's talk about the dark side. Uh, and and you've, you've read Lencioni, right? Um, no, I haven't. Oh, Lack of Commitment. There's five dysfunctions of a team. Fantastic book. Lack of Commitment, Inattention to Results, Culture of Mistrust, um, Fear of Conflict. What's the other one? Uh, avoidance, avoidance of accountability. This is purposeful misalignment for selfish motives. Now, you don't want to really start getting into that when you're facilitating a team and, and talking about that overtly. 
because no one's going to admit to it. I mean, it's, it, it's a kind of, it's a coaching, it's a counseling conversation sometimes, let's face it. Um, but that's all there as well. And if you've got a really toxic culture and a very difficult team where this is at play, um, they're not going to align. Um, and it's going to be very hard to get that alignment. Um, and that's something that I think as a facilitator would be a role or as a leader would be a role to, if it's not actually happening from the leader themselves, it would be a role to observe that and start to pick up on what's going wrong, what's really going on here. Because if you can start to see those themes and behaviours in the team in a workshop like that, that's really useful information too, but you may not be able to get to it in the workshop. Something I thought might be worth touching on for our listeners uh, is, is your journey here, right? You've gone from being a communications consultant to a, a tech startup founder. I mean, how's that been for you, Lindsay? Well, I mean, I, when I left university, um, I started up a car sharing agency because I wanted to match up passengers and drivers going the same way long distance from, from city to city for students. And I, I'm basically more of an entrepreneur than I ever was a communications consultant. I mean, I got really annoyed with ambiguity. I, got, I, got, I think I've been fired three times. I mean, I, I, the corporate life for me was lovely in a sense that you get the kind of, you actually have less responsibility um, you know, as a person. You have a role responsibility. And um, the games people play is, oh, I did my head in, I can't tell you. So when I ran this um, car sharing agency, it was full of tech technology as well we, we were trying to build a computer program the internet oh i'm telling you my age now but the internet hadn't really kicked off i had a fax machine um and we got loads of publicity and marketing and and, and i guess that's why i got picked as a communication person because i had lots of marketing experience which just goes to show you how immature the selection was for communications consultants at that time to my benefit uh, because i learned a lot from working in these large organizations um but it's been liberating, but it's also been a real journey. But I mean, I've kept a little log of, log of it every couple of weeks about what's happened over the last three or four years to get to this point. And um, it's such a personal development journey. I mean, it's, it, I, I, I love it. I'd never stop it, but you know, really big test on, on trying to deal with people who are just looking at me like I'm totally crazy when I'm talking about developing an alignment tool. Um, you know, while I'm not a facilitator really myself. And, um, but I, I, I really love it actually. You know, despite all of the lows and the difficulties, I'm, I'm more and more convinced that this has got a real purpose and I really want to alleviate frustration in the workplace because I found it so difficult myself. And I just think it's so much about value to be gained from this. This is my thing now. So it's not so much of a difference, to be honest. I think that the, the difference, the difficult leap was me being a communication consultant. <laughs> right. So it's uh yeah, you're going back to what uh, back to where you started, right? As a, but and and fascinating to so you were well ahead of your time. You were ride sharing pre internet. I mean, that's that's something. Yeah, and um, we never got the critical mass going. We had we had thousands of members, and it was a you know that was a big big effort. Four years again of not being paid, and oh god. Um, that's why corporate life was so nice. You get salary. Oh my God. But, um, yeah, I look at Uber now and uh, it's a completely different business model. Of course, it was just like, God damn it. You know, it, there was something in it after all, because there are plenty of relatives and friends of mine going, what is she doing? So, um, but it's just this, I, it's just the put two resources together to get a better outcome. Ride sharing, for example. Um, that's what, I think alignment is about a bit as well. It's like putting together what two people, two perspectives together and you get something better. Uh, so maybe there's something in your soul that needs, that, that's drawn to this problem, you know, in, in different guises. Well, I think there's a lot of things I'm not good at, but I'm organized and creative. And I think this, I'm just organizing fog. I want to organize my way out of fog. That's what's going on here. <laughs> It could be a new strap line. <laughs> so, there may be, so there may be a few listeners here in, in a position you know, as you were perhaps a few years ago who uh, either have a corporate job or, or a consultant or some, some, and, and are thinking about going down the startup route. 
what, what do you tend to offer people in that position as, as advice or, or, or lessons from your journey? Gosh, well, I'd say uh, if you are fully convinced that what you're doing is worthwhile, has a market, if you're convinced there's a market there somewhere, um, hopefully you already have customers and you don't have to go through a big, difficult journey of persuading people what even the product is. Um, but if you do, absolutely stick to it. Absolutely stick to it. Keep adjusting to be better and better, at, but don't give up. Don't give up at all. That's what I'd say. Yeah, that's, a, that's very inspiring, I'm sure, for people. And something you hear a lot from the successful yeah. entrepreneurs is... is well, yeah. Mirror Mirror is yet to kind of get out there. It's still a startup. So uh, let's hope I get to the point where I can say um, it's, it's a full success at some point in time. Okay. And then for people who, who are interested in the conversation and want to check out the tool, where should they go? Yeah. So the, the website is mirrormirrorhub.com. That's one word. Um, mirror Mirror Hub, H-U-B dot com. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, but yeah, please reach out to me. We're training facilitators. Uh, we're just going through a round of training, 40 people this month. We've got another round of training coming up in March. Um, at the moment, it's free. We want to change that soon. Um, but it's free because we want to, where well, there's a betting process, you have to be experienced and, and, uh, and capable of uh, dealing with teams with situations like this. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's open to people who want to learn more about Mirror Mirror and use it for their clients and get into a network where we hopefully bring bigger clients to share work okay. so get in touch and uh, very open to that but all, and also for people who are working in-house in a company presumably again they can reach out, out for you and you'll put them in touch with consultants who, who can help if, if they require that yes yes we 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 we're um just reaching out we don't have a geographical limitation or anything it's uh virtual training and um uh very open to to, to hearing what people need and want Excellent. All right. Well, Lindsay, thank you so much for your time. It's been a fascinating conversation. Uh, I'm sure it's going to do really well. You know, I, I experienced the tool yesterday and there's so much in there uh, that, well, as you say, as you say yourself, there's nothing quite like it right now. And, uh, and it's solving a real problem for people. So thank you very much, Richard. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lindsay.